Hey, animation class. You don't need to lie to me. I know I look rough. My children gave me pink eye. I have a cold. My nurse friend tells me that I probably don't have coronavirus. Who really knows for sure? But I don't have enough symptoms for them to test me. So we're just hanging in there. You can see that I'm still in my office, but this will only last until Friday when I bring my computer home. It's gonna be so exciting. Anyway, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break this week's lecture up into three pieces. We're gonna talk about Norman McLaren and the Film Board of Canada. We are going to talk about um, television and animation, and that's a huge topic, and I was actually gonna skip it in this class anyway, so we might consider that one an optional lecture. And we are going to uh, introduce George Dunning's Yellow Submarine, which you have as a streaming link on your Canvas site. And for those of you following along at home who aren't actually in this class and don't have access to the Canvas site, you can find Yellow Submarine streaming, and I'll try to put that information in the, um, in the, the description for this video as well. Okay. When we left off, we were talking about UPA and how it took the world of animation by storm with its dry and cerebral humor, with its willingness to be adult, and most specifically with its modern art-influenced aesthetics. And these aesthetics, and especially the aesthetics of limited animation, are going to have a huge influence on other animated works going forward. For a quick reminder on what full versus limited animation means, here you go. So limited animation was this stylistic solution to tight production schedules because remember, essentially you're using fewer drawings. We can justify it in terms of artistic choices, especially when it comes to UPA, but when we go forward with uh, television production and animation, this is going to be a major boon for tight production schedules. We'll see that in a little bit when we talk about, for instance, Hanna-Barbera on television. But remember too, that art animation is born with UPA. Remember that John Hubley and, Z and Zachary Schwartz are talking about how animation can visualize areas of life and thought in a different way than any other art form. So UPA, is art animation. We really do think of art animation as being born with UPA. Now we are going to see that Disney co-opts this style as well in a few different ways. For example, this is Disney's Toot, Whistle, Plunk, and Boom from 1953. You can see these flat planes of color, the playing with perspective, geometric shapes, clean lines. Very stylized, owing something to modern art. Of course, audiences didn't always adapt to this new language of limited animation. And people who loved you know, tradition thought that it was often poor drawing, uh, incompetence. So full animation still does get its due here. And these two big schools, full versus limited animation, still kind of vie for the favor of the public today. Next, we're gonna be talking more about folks who perceive animation as this kind of singularly expressive art form, capable of expressing emotion in a way that nothing else really can. It can express ideas, abstractions, emotions. And we have started to see that with UPA for sure, but we're going to see a lot of folks taking that to the next level. These people are gonna be seeing celluloid as a canvas, and some of them, especially Norman McLaren, are going to be scratching, painting, drawing directly on the celluloid. This is also going to be a different form of spectatorship we're talking about here. 
we're going to go back to what we were talking about a few weeks ago with uh, with abstract animation, with avant-garde cinema, and the kind of the different frame of mind that you have to be in to let it wash over you, to get what um, is important to you about what you're seeing. You are an active participant in a spectatorship here. I just looked back at some of the videos of myself and God, I look awful. This is better. Okay, the other thing that I want to say is that we're talking about the 1950s and 60s here, right? We're talking about a time period when a lot of people are experimenting with drugs, they're experimenting with psychedelics, they're experimenting with altered ways of perception. So some of these artists are going to be thinking about uh, animation as a way of getting at a different kind of perception, getting at the, the ability to maybe recapture childhood perception, to, to show you some, some kind of unadulterated or unfiltered version of what your mind's eye might see. And that's what's really so exciting about some of this interesting stuff coming out of the National Film Board of Canada. All right, we're gonna focus for the rest of this video on Norman McLaren. Norman McLaren was born in Scotland in the teens and he was exposed at a very early age to Felix and the Silly Symphonies. By age 16, he was watching Soviet montage films, and if you know anything about that, you know you're, they're all about the power of images to convey ideas, the idea that film can have political power. You remember Eyes and Sun and the Plasmatic? Well, this is that. He was also into German Expressionists, too, which, if you'll remember, were um, an influence on Lottie Reiniger, who made The Adventures of Prince Ahmed. Anyway, so in 1932, he went to the Glasgow School of Art and he started animating at the age of 18. He liked cameraless animation from the get-go because he didn't need a camera. He found a 35mm projector abandoned in a school basement and he could project films, but he didn't have a camera to shoot them. So he would get celluloid, he would use chemicals to soak off the emulsion, and then paint directly on it. Now, by the way, he wasn't the first to do this. There was an animator named Len Lai who did it first in the 30s. Um, but, uh, and Lin Lai actually also worked for the general post office unit like McLaren did. But eventually he did get a camera and his short film started catching the attention of people in local festivals. Here's another uh, image of him at work painting directly on film. And his films look something like this, or like this. In 1937, he joined the General Post Office in London. John Grierson, an important documentary filmmaker, had been slowly turning the PR department of the post office in England into a groundbreaking film unit. Isn't that amazing? These were government-sponsored films, but beautiful. Was I talking about uh, beautiful films? Right, sorry, I had a tightness in my chest and I was pretty sure for a second it was coronavirus, but then it went away. Okay, so Grierson made lots of documentaries. He's incredibly important in the history of documentary. Uh, one of them is Night Mail, in which they, you know, they follow uh, the train as it takes the mail all over England during the night, and it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous film. Anyway, this is important because Grierson is invited the next year to study film production in Canada, and he tells them they should create a national institute of some kind for film production. Why might Canada think this is a good idea? Have a centralized location for making films about Canadian culture that express a Canadian point of view? Well, probably because of America and its cultural imperialism. Anyway, they do. I mean, there's subtle political messages at work here with regard to the relationship between the US and Canada. There's issues of border concerns. And as we all know, that has never gone away. Anyway, Grierson becomes the head of the newly created National Film Board of Canada in 1939. In the meantime, McLaren does a bunch of stuff. He moves to the U.S., he works in New York, he makes some films for the Goog, uh, sorry, the Guggenheim. He figures out how to draw on film to manipulate the optical soundtrack as well, so pops and whistles and all sorts of interesting stuff you can do by manipulating the optical soundtrack. Then Grierson invites McLaren to Canada, where he makes a couple of short films to help the Canadian war effort by moving citizens to buy defense bonds. And one of these we already watched, which was Hen Hop. This was 1942. So in 1943, McLaren is asked to organize a separate department of the National Film Board of Canada devoted to animation. And he hired a lot of promising young animators. And because of this, a bunch of important animators, including George Dunning, who we'll also be talking about in a bit, joined the National Film Board of Canada. All right, let's watch something. This is 1949's Begone Dull Care, which won some awards. And even Picasso said, finally, something new. 
I'm just going to show a tiny clip of it in this video, but I will also provide a link to you. McLaren's work can be tough on audiences, but it's because I mean, it's kind of cold, but like exuberant at the same time. But hopefully we laid the groundwork for that in this class by talking about abstract animation and the way that you kind of need to let it wash over you. It might not be about a metaphor. It might not be about any kind of narrative. Instead, it might be about a state of mind and producing a state of mind and a feeling and emotion in you. And here's what McLaren himself says about his films. Every film for me is a kind of a dance because the most important thing in film is motion, movement. No matter what it is you're moving, whether it's people or objects or drawings, and in what way it's done, it's a form of dance. So Gina Alberto Bendazzi talks about McLaren's films. I think I gave you that reading, maybe, maybe not. So rhythm is incredibly important to McLaren's works. Now McLaren didn't just work in uh, the painting of celluloid or the manipulation of the filmic material itself. He also made more narrative films as well. This is Neighbors from 1952. It's made using pixelation, which is a non-traditional animation technique where live actors, usually people, are used as frame-by-frame -frame subjects in an animated film. So a live actor holds a pose while a frame is taken or captured, and then they change their pose pose just a little bit before a successive frame is captured. So while you're watching this, Think about how we might interpret it and how the technique works to create meaning and to have an emotional impact on the viewer. To be fair though, it's not all animation as you can see right there. But this gets kind of brutal. There's a scene that was cut at one point and then restored after the Vietnam War. Hey, what do you think that flower might represent? 
So I'll give you the link to this as well. This is just on Vimeo. But think about what the film says about conformity versus individuality as well. So as you might imagine, hijinks are going to ensue after this. And to direct traffic towards the sites that are actually hosting these films instead of just reproducing them, I'm going to stop it here. And I'm going to tell you that Norman McLaren made a whole lot of other really important films too, and I encourage you to seek them out. Many of them are on YouTube. Norman McLaren died in 1987. All right, that's the end of this video. Here, I'll, I'll end it on a better frame. There you go. Stay tuned for the next video, which is going to be about George Denning, and it's going to introduce Yellow Submarine.